But she answered him, Sir, even the dogs under the table eat the children's crumbs. Then he said to her, For saying that, you may go. The demon has left your daughter. So she went home and found the child lying on the bed, and the demon gone. I love that passage. And in this passage, for me, it's really helpful. Uh, but it's hard for us to understand still what it means to hunger for God. In our American culture, uh, as the next slide says, we have an abundance of everything, and it's hard to be hungry for anything. Think about that in your personal life. John Piper in his book, A Hunger for God, says, if we don't feel strong desires for the manifestation of the glory of God, it's not because you have drunk deeply and are satisfied, it is because we have nibbled so long at the table of the world. Our souls they are stuffed with small things, and there is no room for the great. And I think that's so true, right? Because we can talk here, sit here and talk about hunger, but most of us don't know what hunger is. Yeah? You could say, oh, well, I know hunger. You know, I've been hungry before. I, I've skipped a meal. I know what hunger is. Even on uh, towards Easter, uh, like me, I'm sure many of you, you fasted. But we do that fasting thing where we eat till Friday afternoon and we eat a lot right before Good Friday worship. And we come and then we say we're fasting. And Saturday, you know, we do our best not to eat. And when that Sunday morning comes, oh my gosh, you know, we are eating like crazy. And I go, oh. I know what hunger is. I know what it means to be hungry. But the real kind of hunger that I'm talking about is the kind of hunger where you don't know if you're going to get another meal. A hunger where you don't know where that next meal is coming from. The Seraphonician woman, she knew what it meant to be hungry for God, I think. She needed help. She needed help bad. She needed help for her daughter who was sick. She thought she was demon possessed. There's something wrong with this girl. I don't know what's going on. But she knew she needed help. And she was willing to go get help anywhere she could get it. From anyone that she could get it from. For me, I can't imagine what it would be like to have a child who is deathly sick. To have my own child who is deathly sick. The Seraphonician woman, she knew. She knew. And it, and it just crushed her heart. And she was hungry for any help she could get. Her daughter was spiritually sick. Her daughter wasn't like other children. Her daughter couldn't do the things that other kids could do. In fact, a lot of times other kids didn't want to hang out with her. She didn't know if her daughter was going to make it. The mom was desperate for help. And she was going to find it and take it anywhere she could get it. That's hunger for help. And one day she hears about Jesus, that Jesus had come into their area. And she doesn't hesitate. If you read that passage, it says, immediately she went to him. She doesn't hesitate. She comes to Jesus and falls at his feet. Right? Falls at his feet. She starts begging, help me. My daughter is sick. Please, help me. Is she sincere? I'm questioning that. And I think a lot of people in Jesus' time that, that were right there were questioning the same thing. Is she sincere? Is she for real? So Jesus tests her sincerity. And he says, I'm not here for you. You know what? To me, you're like a dog. Oh, right? That hurts. What? I'm coming to you and you're telling me I'm, a, I'm like a dog? And he says, I'm not here for you. I'm here for the people of God. So leave me alone. But the woman, she doesn't turn away. She's not deterred. She's not discouraged. Why? Because she is hungry to get help for her daughter. The daughter that she loves. She is hungry for God. She knows it's only going to be a miracle that takes care of this child. 
And like a dog that is hungry for any kind of scrap that falls from the table, she is hungry for God, for the grace of God. So she owns it. She owns what Jesus calls him, and she said, okay, you call me a dog? Okay, I am a dog. I am a dog. I am a hungry dog that is waiting for anything to fall from the table. Anything. And I will take it. Have you ever seen a dog that is hungry at the table? Right? We don't know what this woman's feeling, but many of us have dogs. We know how dogs behave. Right? We've got a couple dogs. I know how they behave. My dog, Mo, uh, Nabi, oh my gosh, that girl is not in her state of mind when she smells something on the table. Right? She will scratch, she will, you know, cry, whimper, do anything for a piece of food. Jean's dog, our little Momo, right? She's got him trained pretty good. She's taught him some tricks. She'll hold a piece of food or a little treat and she'll say, sit, and then he sits. He goes down, and then she he gets down and lies down. And goes, roll over, and then he'll roll over. And then, then he'll sit up there again and she goes, turn around, and then he'll twirl around, right? I go, that's pretty good, isn't it? This dog is also crazy. She'll hold a piece of food, and without even her saying to uh, say, so for him to do something, he'll sit, lay down, roll over, and spin around, and then wait for the food. Right? That's crazy! He's willing to do anything he knows to get that little piece of scrap. And I think that's what I see in this woman. She is willing to do anything in her life to get help from Jesus. She's willing to do anything. She is hungry for God. She's got a daughter that she loves, so she's willing to do anything. You know, I think that's the kind of hunger that we need in our life for God. But like I said before, with an abundance of everything, it's hard to be hungry for anything. To live well, I think we have to approach God in this way. Where we will do anything to bring Him into our life. Where we will do anything to experience His goodness in our day. Anything that we know, unashamed, coming down and falling on our knees, begging God, God, I need you today. And I will bet that even 90%, maybe even 95% of us, have not experienced that falling to our knees this past week. How many of you, think about it, have you fallen to your knees and said, God, I need you. I am so hungry for you. I will do anything to bring you into my life today. I will do anything for you, your grace to be poured down upon this relationship that I have, this work environment that I have, this messed up thing that I have, that's just crazy. I need you. Most of us, we don't do it because we have an abundance of things in our life. There's a character in the Bible. His name was David. One of the greatest kings. One of the wealthiest kings of the Bible in the Old Testament. Right? Uh, he probably had, he had so many women, he didn't even know all their names. He probably didn't even know all their faces. They probably just said, oh, I'm your wife. Okay, you may go now. Right? So many. Wealth. He was so wealthy. His kingdom was great. But David, he knew there were parts in his life when he wasn't a king. There was parts in his life when he was just a little boy and people looked down on him. There were parts in his life when people didn't like him, when people chased him around, wanted to kill him. And he remembers those times of how he just cling to God and say, God, I need you to protect me. I need your help. I need your presence in my life. David knew. So even when he became a great king, he still remembered what it meant to be hungry for God. And he wrote this song, this song, 63. And this is when he was a king. It is, even in his abundance, he writes this song. And he says, Oh God, 
You are my God. I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh faints for you, as in a dry and weary land where there is no water. So I have looked upon you in the sanctuary, beholding your power and glory, because your steadfast love is better than life. My lips will praise you. I will bless you as long as I live. I will lift up my hands and call on your name. And just like David, I really believe we need to maintain a hunger for God in our life in all of our abundance. I'm not saying that your abundance is wrong, but I'm saying that your abundance sometimes keeps you from experiencing God. That your abundance keeps you from coming to your knees and begging to God and saying, God, I need you. John Piper continues in his book and he says, our appetites dictate the direction of our lives. Whatever you are hungry for will determine where your life goes. I believe that's true. I believe, like David, we have to remind ourselves of what it means for us to be hungry for God. And one great way of doing that, you know, I'm just dying to talk to Susan and all the people for us who went to Guatemala and for that mission trip. See, we have to take trips like that. And more than the help that we give to the people of Guatemala, I really believe we got to go to help ourselves. we got to go to remind ourselves of what it means for us, what it means for a people to really hunger for God, to need help, to take us to that place where we can get to our knees and say, God, I'm praying. I'm praying to you. I need your help. When we go visit, when we go out and serve in downtown Seattle under the freeway and we serve the hungry people. Because we're not really hungry. We've got to be reminded. And we see, when we see people who are hungry just for the next meal, who are just thirsting to get a clean pair of socks and some underwear, right? we, we remind them what it means to be hungry and in need. We need those kind of reminders in our life. Because you know what? You know what happens when we live in abundance too long? That abundance influences our spiritual life. Meaning this. There are so many things in our life. Right? We can talk about hunger, but it has no impact. It's like I was talking with one of our church people, and we're talking about the trip to Guatemala, and I said, what do you think would happen if, you know, one of those Guatemalan people were to go into some place like Costco. I think it would be mind blowing, wouldn't it? You look at you go, where does this aisle of food end? It doesn't end. There's more in the back. It just doesn't end. It would just blow their mind. You know. We get so used to our Costco lifestyle. If we have a need, we don't turn to God. We turn to Costco. I do. If we have a hard time right, making friends, we need social life, we need some social activity in our life, we don't come to God's community, God's people, and say, hey, I, I, I need some friendship. I need some accountability. Right? I need some encouragement. What do we do? We join Facebook. I do. Oh, look where Bo went. <laughs> or something like that, right? Don't you look at other people and go, wow, they're doing something great. I gotta post something. Oh, I don't have anything to post. That's what abundance does to us. Instead of turning to God and God's community, we keep turning to other stuff. And when we really do need help, when we really do need God's grace, His healing, because we've been conditioned to turn to other things in our life, what happens is when we really, really, really need to turn to God, now 